gospel for today comes from St. Matthew, the fifth chapter, beginning with the 21st verse. Lord, you, Lord. You're familiar with the command to the ancients, do not murder. I'm telling you that anyone is so much as angry with a brother or sister is guilty of murder. Carelessly call a brother idiot, and you just might find yourself hauled into court. Thoughtlessly yell stupid at a sister, and you are on the brink of hellfire. The simple moral fact is that words kill. This is how I want you to conduct yourselves in these matters. If you enter your place of worship and, about to make an offer, you suddenly remember a grudge a friend has against you, abandon your offering, leave immediately, go to this friend and make things right. Then and only then come back and work things out with God. Or say you're out on the street and an old enemy accosts you. Don't lose a minute. Make the first move. Make things right with him. After all, if you leave the first move to him, knowing his track record, you're likely to end up in court, maybe even jail. If that happens, you won't get out without a stiff fine. You know the next commandment pretty well, too. Don't go to bed with another spouse. But don't think you've preserved your virtue simply by staying out of bed. Your heart can be corrupted by lust even quicker than your body. Those leering looks you think nobody notices, they also corrupt. Let's not pretend this is easier than it really is. If you want to live a morally pure life, here's what you have to do. You have to blind your right eye the moment you catch it in a lustful leer. You have to choose to live one-eyed or lose, or else be dumped in a moral trash pile. And you have to chop off your right hand the moment you notice it raised threateningly. Better a bloody stump than your entire being discarded for good in the dump. Remember the scripture that says, whoever divorces his wife, let him do it legally. Give her divorce papers and her legal rights. Too many of you are using that as a cover for selfishness and whim, pretending to be righteous just because you are legal. Please, no more pretending. If you divorce your wife, you're responsible for making her an adulteress, unless she has already made herself that bisexual promiscuity. If you marry such a divorce adulteress, you're automatically an adulterer yourself. You can't use legal cover to mask a moral failure. And don't say anything you don't mean. This counsel is embedded deep in our traditions. You only make things worse when you lay down a smokescreen of pious talk saying, I'll pray for you, and never doing it. Or saying, God be with you, and not meaning it. You don't make your words true by embellishing them with religious lace. In making your speech sound more religious, it becomes less true. Just say yes and no. When you manipulate words to get your own way, you go wrong. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Christ. You may be seated. <laughs> I like hearing that chuckle you are. <laughs> Would you please pray with me? Gracious Lord God, you come to us in <coughs> truth. You come to us knowing everything about us, the deepest secrets we like to keep hidden to the greatest joys that we can't help but express. Lord God, you are our creator and you are our savior. You created us so that you can be yourself and that is love. Lord God, we know we are human. We know we are broken, or at least give us the wisdom to understand that truth. Lord God, open our hearts and our minds, knowing that we need you, and you need to love us because you are love. In your name I pray, amen. amen. So on Thursday we had our pastor's meeting, and um, this is that text that a lot of pastors go, oh my goodness, it's the divorce text. And 
and some it was the kind of buzz in the room was they're asking each other, we're asking each other, are you doing are you preaching on the gospel? I'm like, yeah. And well that was kind of like some people, well, I think I'm gonna stick with the old testament. No. After hearing this text, I know what everybody's thinking. You know. When I was an intern um, at one of our uh, preaching points um, over at American School in Japan in Tokyo, I remember um, standing as, as this young, squeaky intern in front of all these very educated teachers, and I could just feel their eyes saying to me, okay, intern, what are you gonna do with this text? Well, I've never shied away from it. Every three years it comes around. And we need to talk about it. We've heard some wonderful messages about light and salt. Jesus says very directly, you are light, you are salt. Those are very important texts. And today is kind of one of the nuts and bolts texts about what that kind of means in our life. Well, in this message Bible version of the text, and this is the first time I've been exposed to the message Bibles as being here, most of us are familiar with the NRSV um, version, but this version makes us really uncomfortable. Did you find it full of good news? Huh? Was it gospel to us? Or did it make you squirm? Did it make you a little uncomfortable? You know, I don't mind being scolded or yelled at by a preacher or a, a prophet of the Old Testament. That's kind of their job. And that's okay. But these are words of Jesus. This is Jesus talking to us. That makes it a little different. You know, when we like to hear about Jesus, we, we were waiting for that gospel message. Words like from the, the songs, Jesus loves me, this I know, those are nice. Jesus loves me, this I know. <sighs> How great thou art. Da, 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 da. We all go, ah, oh, that is wonderful. It's great stuff. Or amazing grace. We hear that and our hearts are warmed. Everything's good. And you know something? Those words are great. When we hear that we're unconditionally loved beyond our understanding. And the truth is, it is amazing grace. Meaning that it's grace beyond our comprehension. Those words are powerful. And they stick with us. And those words sometimes are the only words that we have that carry us through those darkest times in our life. And believe me, in the ICU I find the most popular song is Jesus Loves Me, This I Know. It's probably the most important go-to song when somebody might be to us at the end of their life. Jesus loves me, this I know, and that's all we have at those times. These words are powerful. And those are the words that we need to listen to. We need to choose to listen to. Sometimes Sometimes we kind of think, though, we're kind of the center of the world. And these words are just about us. Well, sometimes they are. If you think that this text is just about me, that's good. If you feel convicted, good. That's the purpose. If you went through this list of things that Jesus was talking about, and you kind of go, uh oh Jesus is talking to me. Be thankful. First of all, be thankful that you, that you realized that you didn't run away from that truth. You see, Jesus is just speaking the truth to us. Especially about things that we might not want to hear. We've all been convicted during, in these texts. If you find yourself like, oh, this is not about me, then you have a problem. That's the person who's got the problem. Not Jesus. We've all Especially by even the definition of murder in this text. Yeah? It's not, I don't know anybody here who's gone out and murdered anybody. I mean, I've never had that kind of thing to deal with. However, using words the way Jesus put it, yeah, we're pretty much all convicted in there. The adultery that we're talking about there, we'll explore that a little bit later, but that's the one I know everybody wants to hear about. <laughs> Empty promises, yeah, we're all pretty... Pretty much busted on that one. We've all made empty promises. We made empty. We made promises that we didn't keep. Yeah, we're all pretty much in there. And then if you drive, 
If you drive, I know you've used the word idiot. And also we've used the word maniac, right? It just comes with driving. You get behind the wheel and you become a different person. The person who's driving real slow is an idiot. The person driving real fast is a maniac, right? That's kind of much busted, including myself, many, many times. Grudges have we? Uh-huh. Grudges? Grudges are really hard to get rid of. Grudges are like a millstone around your neck that weigh you down. A grudge or having hate for somebody or hate for this or that, that requires actual energy in your body to maintain. That you don't need. To maintain a grudge or hate or something like that, to keep justifying or do whatever, you're using up energy and intellectual properties you don't need to do. Jesus has given to me. You don't need that. You don't need that millstone. That's what we talk about forgiveness so much. Forgiveness is a way of being freed from this millstone of grudge. There's this one time I was attending the 60th anniversary of the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And um, it was amazing. I, I got to meet Wally Schirra and Chuck Yeager. And um, it was an amazing event because... The whole theme was reconciliation. And notice in our, some of our sides, we have this word reconciliation up here. It's really, really good. It's perfect. But the whole theme was reconciliation because up in the front, on the right side, there was a group of veterans, Japanese veterans of World War II from the Imperial Japanese Air Force. And some of them participated in the bombing of Pearl Harbor. They were right up front, right with Wally Sharon, Chuck Yeager, the governor, all these people, and the whole thing was talking about reconciliation. Now, I've lived in Japan a long time, and now our, our countries have come together where now the United States Navy and the self Defense Forces Navy of Japan working together side by side. We've come a long way. And that's after the, the ceremony, and yeah, I got my picture with Chuck Yeager, oh boy. He just turned 90 something this, this last week or something. But anyways, we're touring, touring the, the, the museum. And we were standing there, and I, and I just made myself in to get between the Japanese veterans, because I wanted to listen to what they're talking about, because I understood them. And we're looking at this beautiful exhibit of a, of a Mitsubishi Zero Fighter. It's absolutely gorgeous at that museum, the Pacific Aviation Museum. And we're looking at it, and, and all the Japanese veterans, you know what they're saying? This plane is better than anything we had. It's gorgeous. And then they looked down and went, and you know, we looked at the tire. Guess where the tire came from? Firestone. And that's what they're talking about. But all the time we were going on here, my host kept telling me and muttering, I will never forgive the Japanese for what they did. I will never forgive them. I hate what they did to our country. She just kept saying it over and over again. And my heart went out to her. She came to worship regularly. She was there all the time. She's, she's heard the gospel, confessed sins, heard, heard she, that she's forgiving, and that's all she could say the whole time that we were there. And she knew that my wife was Japanese. My heart went out to her. It still does. She heard the gospel, but I really wonder if she ever really listened to it. You know, we hear what we want to hear, and we see what we want to see. We try sometimes to distance ourselves from the truth if we don't like hearing what the truth is saying, especially if the truth is exposing something that we need to deal with. We like to justify words that we've said that have been hurtful, and we've known it. We sometimes try to run away or disconnect ourselves or try and not be involved with the damage that we might have created. Yeah, the text convicts us. It goes right to our heart. But I want you to know something before I go on. Words of love, grace, mercy are always more powerful than words of hate, judgment, and fear. Remember that. Words of grace Love, mercy are more powerful than judgment, hate, and fear. Never forget that. 
We like to dwell on the judgment part or, or who we need to hate, things like that. But love is more powerful than anything like that. And God is the one who sees that in us. You see, because like sin is anything that really, this is my definition of sin, there's a whole bunch of them, is anything that draws you away from being light and salt. Sin is anything that draws us away from understanding that we are loved beyond understanding. Sin is anything that draws us away from the love of God. It's pretty broad, pretty broad definition, but I think it works. Because when we look and we say God is love, well that tells us something. For love to exist, what needs to also exist? The object of love. Alright? God created us so that God could love us. That's why we say, for Jesus' sake, God forgives us all our sins. God needs to love us. That's why we were created. And God needs to hear our praise. But God also wants, us, wants to hear our confession. And say, we need you, Lord. And God will always be there for us, 70 times 7. God is the one who is faithful. We're the ones that, I, I'm like Dory, okay, we all know that. You know me. Oh, oh, shiny thing, okay, that's just who I am. That's just who you all know that. But that's who we kind of are. We get drawn, um, our, our attention gets, gets drawn to something away from the truth of God loving us. And Jesus says, I welcome you back. You think about even in our worship, ah, I love, I love our worship when we come together. What is the first thing that we do when we come here? Of course, we're blessed by music and nice announcements. But one of the first things we do is we confess our sins. And we do it corporately. We do it as a group. Because we have sinned against God and one another. Pay attention to the words of our confession. We have sinned against God and we sinned against one another, right? And then, so if we're convicted, then our hearts, if we really listen, our hearts begin to say, Lord, unto whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Lord, you have the words our hearts crave to hear. And then you hear, we hear, we are forgiven. And at that moment, we're made new. At that moment, our, our, we are now prepared to hear the scripture, hear the word, praise God, receive the commun receive communion. And we do it together because we are a community. We are the objects of God's love. This relationship, this community, this communion with God is everything. That's why the Lord's Supper is called what? Communion. Communion. Because we are community. We're made whole through this gift of forgiveness. We are made whole through this grace that we cannot understand. And then we are called then to share who we are. For God so loved the world. It's not just about us, gang. Eh? For God so loved the world. That means the stranger, the orphan, the widow. All the people that we put all kinds of labels on so we don't have to deal with them or we can put them away. God says, no, I love them too. And our faith is what gives us the strength to love those who are different from us or just even ourselves. Sometimes the greatest persecutor and executioner, who is it? For me, it's me. For many of us, hardest person to forgive is ourselves. And so then I go, Jesus, give me the strength to at least just forgive myself so that I can forgive my neighbors. And then I can come to this place, this wonderful place called church, and be with the body of Christ. And know that I'm not alone. And I come with all of you and we come before the cross. We come before the cross and we give it all to Jesus and Jesus says, it's mine. It's mine now. It's not yours. You are free. You are forgiven. You are made a community. Now, be that community. Live in joy. Live in love. Make music. Make art. How's the ones that need
to know that they're loved and cared for, which I'm so proud of our congregation for doing. Be God's people in the world. Be salt. Be light. Proclaim goodness. Proclaim love. Proclaim our Lord. Amen.